Civil society organization could figure out who is responsible for human rights violations, um, whether an individual or a state, and how to seek justice and redress for victims internationally and nationally. Then civil society could create stronger advocacy and push for changes on the ground through legal analysis. No, legal analysis is not something only lawyers or people with some legal backgrounds can do. The essential work involves answering primary questions such as who did that and what did the person do and how did the person do it based on the data and documentation collected by the civil society organizations and defining whether there is a right protected under international law. Anyone can do this. It may not be easy and take time at first, but once you understand the structure and sources of international law, you'll become familiar with how to analyze the facts using international law. There might be complex situations, but there are many secondary sources and a case law that can be used to help refine your analysis. Legal analysis requires a thorough understanding of the facts, so all documentation and data your organization collects can be used for legal analysis. To figure out which law to use, you need to know the difference between human rights and humanitarian laws. International human rights law refers to the body of international law um, designed to promote and protect human rights at the international, regional, and domestic level. International human rights law primarily consists of treaties and customary international law. It is important to note that international human rights law applies at all times, both in times of peace and in times of armed conflict. This means that both international human rights and humanitarian law are applicable during armed conflicts. Unlike international human rights law, international humanitarian law applies only in armed conflicts, both in international and non-international armed conflict. International humanitarian law is binding to all parties to a conflict, state and non-state actors. A major part of international humanitarian law is contained in the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 and of two 1977 additional protocols. In addition, the 1907 Hague Convention and the Annex Regulations set out important rules on the conduct of hostilities, notably on military occupation. I think the question could be rephrased, what kind of rights are protected under international law? and how to assess the state party's compliance with international law. First, we will want to have a clear understanding of the facts and define an issue. Next, we will have to identify a source of law that applies. It would be helpful to try a hypothetical example. Let's say that we identify the situation where a person was subject to ill treatment during investigation in state A and want to know whether it constitutes torture under international law. To figure out which law apply, the first thing to do is to ascertain whether the state has ratified the treaty. It is also necessary to check whether the state has made a reservation or an interpretive declaration at the time of ratification. On the UN Treaty Body database, you can search the ratification status by country or treaty. Here, treaties that seem relevant are International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights and Convention Against Torture. Also, there might be other treaties on the regional level. Now we have specific provisions related to torture under International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and Convention Against Torture. The text of the provision is a good place to start. In some instances, because of the intensity or nature of the certain acts, it is clear that the act constitutes torture. However, it is hard to decide whether the act amounts to torture in some instances. 
Then the next question we will have is what factors should be considered to determine whether the case amounts to torture or whether it does not reach this threshold. And then we will need to look into other sources such as individual complaints, advisory opinions, general comments, reports, resolutions, concluding observations and control reports and judgments on the treaty bodies' websites. There are currently 10 human rights treaty bodies. The treaty body issues general comments and recommendations which interpret human rights treaties and they can be found on their website. You can further analyze the scope of torture by considering the general comments and jurisprudence of the treaty bodies, in particular the Human Rights Committee, which monitors compliance with the ICCPR, and the Committee Against Torture, which monitors compliance with the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment of punishment. The next question is, how do you assess whether the state complies with its obligation under international law? Once a treaty has entered into force and is binding upon the state parties, they must perform the treaty obligations in good faith. State's legal obligations to protect human rights um, implies an obligation to prevent, investigate, and punish human rights violators, as well as to restore rights whenever possible or provide compensation. To be specific, states that are party to Convention Against Torture has an obligation to take effective legislative, administrative, judicial, or other measure to prevent acts of torture in any territory under its jurisdiction. Therefore, we'll need to look into state legislation, policy, and practice regarding torture, and then assess whether the state comply with its obligation under the treaty. As mentioned, the four Geneva Convention and their additional protocols form um, the framework for the treatment of soldiers, prison of war, and non-combatants during armed conflicts. It is important to note that the proper category of armed conflict is necessary to determine which set of rule applies to the conflict, because international humanitarian law classifies armed conflict as either international armed conflict or non-international armed conflict. The International Committee of the Red Cross hosts an international humanitarian law treaty database on their website. And the website contains many introductory international humanitarian law resources. Their website is a good place to begin your research for international humanitarian law. It depends. It is hard to say exactly how long it takes. If the facts are clear, it can be easy. If the facts are complicated, it takes time. But looking up secondary sources um, such as journal or article helps your research because it provides overview um, of the issues you are interested in.